Hi, Molly. Hi. Tonight I have the opportunity. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm honored. I don't know if I'll have anything new to say, but I'm glad you're here. Yeah. <laughs> we'll give it another minute or two, Marjorie. Let me look here. Uh, yeah, you, we can start. Start? Okay. Oh, yeah, we can Carol. start. Good. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Hi. So last week was Shum Shon part one. Some of you were here then and some of you weren't. Um, I'm going to do a super speedy recap because we have a lot for tonight. Um, but um, uh, even if you weren't here, you probably know that um, his birth was foretold in a way that was truly biblical, right? An angel came to the mother and not the father. The father is uh, almost a comic figure who uh, says, no, come again to me. The malach goes again to the wife. Then the instructions are only for the wife. Uh, then he wants to uh, be like Avram Avinu and feed the maybe malachim and they have him give a korban. He wants to know their names. So if a baby's born, he can make People magazine. The guy says, <laughs> Kelly, which either means it's, it's a secret and you're not going to know, or my name is awesome. I mean, actually, the word, you know, amazing, like an ifla. And... Um, and we certainly expect the mother to be an important character. And she may be in Shimshon's psyche, uh, but we, the only thing we hear again of the parents is a little quetch when he gets married and that they don't, they don't really connect with their son. He doesn't share with them and they don't make an effort to reach out to him. Hi, Ellen. So that's how Shimshon was born. And you expect greatness from him. And you know he's coming into the world in a category that no other person has ever come into the world. Nazir min habatan, a Nazir from the womb. And we talked about how the whole point of the Nizirut is a personal decision to, uh, um, to not drink wine or eat great products, to not become defiled by the dead, and, um, uh, and not to cut the hair. And Shimshon has this odd mishmash. When it comes to the great products, it, it applies definitely to the mother while she's pregnant. There's nothing further in the Sefer that says it applies to him. The rabbis see a hint in the fact that he seems to avoid a vineyard. When it comes to the not cutting the hair, 100% observance. And the last rule, not becoming Tame mate, Shimshon made a lifetime career of becoming Tame mate, right? He killed so many people. Uh, and it seems with uh, God giving him the power to do it, obviously he wasn't expected to refrain from that. We're not going to review all the issues and the views of, um, of what a Nazir is, if it's a positive thing, if it's a compromise with a problem, if it's more therapeutic for the person, if it's uh, some sort of religious ideal. Just to stay with one little thing on the word Nazir. The word Nazir is often translated as parush, separated, and that's why in modern Hebrew, a Nazir is a nun or a monk. But it also, Nazir also means like a coronet or a crown, and is sometimes used to describe the seats of the Kohen Gadol. Mm -hmm. Whatever the word exactly means, there's no doubt Shimshon was marked on his, he on his head as someone who was different. You saw it, you can call it a crown or you can call it something else, but 
It was so visible. It's like Andrea's purple hair. By the way, Andrea doesn't <laughs> have purple hair, but whenever she comes here, the, some trick of the light. So you notice that right away, right? So <laughs> he definitely stood out due to his Mizirut. The reason I'm emphasizing that is there seems to be that he at least sees it as something secret when it's something so overt and visible. So we're going to have to come back to that later. Before and, Rachel, just let me interrupt you for one second. Um, yeah. None of my functions are working on my iPad for some reason. I'm unable to chat or anything and I'm unable to mute people and there's some background noise. So if everybody uh -huh. could mute, that oh, would be yes. really helpful. That would be great, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you, sorry. It's okay. All right, here we are, good to go. So um, uh, um, so now Shimshon uh, matures and the spirit of Hashem begins to ring inside him. And now what is the great man going to do? And what he does, he goes out among the plishtim, sees a cute girl and says to her parent, his parents, Take her for me for a wife. Like any Jewish parent, they said, why, you can't find a nice girl among our own girls? And he rather coarsely says, I don't really want to hear your opinion. Zayashar be'enai, and they comply. And the Torah has this very important narrator's statement, which was, avi ve'imo lo yadu, so first, the opposite of everything we know about Jewish life, that it's from Hashem that he should marry a plishti, not only a non-Jew, not only an avoda Zaranik, but the arch enemy of Am Yisrael. And this is the guy of whom it was foretold before he was born, he'll deliver us from Israel. But the rest of the Pasuk says, Ki because he is seeking a pretext, a justification to attack the Plishtim. So is it that Hashem is the one who's seeking the pretext and got him to want to do something definitely wrong? because it's a means justify the ends thing? Or is it that Shimshon himself, along with knowing that he's Nazir Min Habatan, has been told that it's his mission to defeat the police team, and in his odd way of thinking about the world, he thought, step one is I get in there with them. And what better way than to marry in? So that is how far we got last time. So now let me share and let's uh, continue. Here we go. Rachel? Yes. There's that phrase again, Hayashar Be'enav, which... Right, Zayashar. I was thinking of that. Nomi noticed in Parshat A that that phrase also comes, Yashar Be'enayim. We're going to talk a lot about it at the end of the Sefer, but you're right. He he shares that to some extent with the people who do wrong in his generation. He does hayashar beinav, what he thinks is right. It's as if there's no standard, no religious standard that he feels bound by. So when we left our story, he, um, he had married the girl. There was the whole trick, which I won't review. Um, with the riddle about the lion, right? He asked, uh, No, I don't know. And they solve it. They say, They solve the puddle, puzzle because uh, they convinced his wife to trick the answer out of him. And he kills 30 guys in Ashkelon, totally innocent. Well, if Plishtim can be seen as innocent, but not involved in the riddle, he kills them. Uh, pays up his bet, 
and he's really mad and he goes home. You almost think, oh, is he done with the plishting? But then he comes back, brings a present. He's, he's going to see what he can do to repair the marriage. And her father says, I thought you gave her away. And um, I thought you weren't interested yourself, so I gave her away to someone else. But you know, she's got a sister who's even nicer. Shimshon flies into a rage and does what uh, uh, Debbie Grossman calls uh, performance art revenge. He ties 300 foxes tail to tail. You notice 30 outfits, 300 foxes. There's this element of multiplying. Right now I'm working on a Haggadah for school and it makes me think of the multiplication of the Makot. And these really are, in a sense, Makot that multiply. And uh, this odd thing of tying foxes tail to tail and they run around like crazy because the, a, a torch is tied between the two tails and they burn the fields in the area. Now, I, I heard a recent lecture, and I don't remember the speaker's name, but she said her son made an interesting suggestion, her 12-year-old son, that maybe the reason for this bizarre setup is to limit the damage, that Shimshon wants to take direct revenge on a certain area. Foxes could run all over the state, let's say, but he wants to limit them to the county, by tying them end to end, they can't get that far. I don't know if it's true. That's certainly not how Yonatan Grossman sees it. I, I mean, David Grossman. He sees it that though, just as Shimshon in some way identified with the lion that he ripped to shreds, but had honey pouring inside of it, that he, just as he saw himself as sort of roaring and powerful, but a, some sort of a sweet core that wasn't recognized by others, he also saw the tail-to-tail -tail foxes and the torches representing him. That he really has two things pulling inside of him all the time. And it causes a kind of fire to burn inside. David Grossman doesn't say this, but his saying that made me think that the lion and the fox, the lion image and the foxes with torches image actually have something in common, which is uh, the inside is different from the outside. The outside is animal and the inside could be seen as something High, right? Fire also can be a positive. Of course, it's also a danger. Anyway, he, um, he burns the fields and he told the father-in-law, once I take revenge for you giving my wife away, Nikiti, I'm all done. No one can accuse me of doing wrong because you wronged me. And that'll be the end of it. But of course, it wasn't the end. And you have on here in so they say Shimshon did it. And I will add, even though it's not in the words, naturally, because the Timnati gave away the wife to one of his so called friends. What you're seeing that the Plishtim think like Shimshon, right? Not only did he think it was legitimate to the, burn the fields, so do the guys in the neighborhood. But the problem is, it's their fields who were, that were burned. So they have to avenge themselves, but on whom? Well, to them, it's obvious they're co plishti who gave the wife away. So they go and they burn her and her father to death. And now Shimshon hears about it. And so he says, if then, if then, right? The red, he, he, he uh, uh, pronounces, im tasun kazot, 
Ki imi kamti bachem. Well, if you're going to do that, my only option is to take revenge, right? Wait a second. The one they burned out was the father-in-law who gave away the wife and the wife who gave away the riddle. But Shimshon sees them as his. It was an attack against him because his uh, policy of revenge extends apparently to all that he defines as his. And so he says, I, I'm going to have to take revenge. And then he says in the blue in Pasuk Zion, Ba'achar echdal, and afterwards I'll stop. Which you don't usually tell the enemy, although some guys recently have in politics, at a certain date I'm going to stop fighting you. But it's, I wonder, is he a little scared by who he's become? He has this compulsion for tit for tat, but he wants the cycle to end. So he says, once I do this next uh, revenge activity, I'm done. I'm going to retire from the field of battle. And that's what he does. No details given in Pasuk Chet. Vayachotam shokal yerech makagadola. He, he, he defeats them in an amazing battle. Vayered Vayeshev the Seif Sela Eitam. And he retires. He doesn't go home to shave at Dan as he, his first going home when he was in a sulk after the wife. And I wonder if maybe he wasn't welcome. If the people in Dan said, uh, you know what, you're going to bring the police team to our doorstep. At any rate, he goes to Seif eight, uh, uh, to this place, Seif Eitam. It's a kind of a crevice and some boulder. It's really a hiding place. And it's within the territory of the tribe of Yehuda. And that's it. Could it, really, he, be, could it really be a place where he is... Actually, actualizing his Nazirut. He Where is, he's actually what? He, I'm sorry, I'm he, not hearing. He, he's actual, actualizing his Nazirut, meaning he's being being isolated from the world. Right, in that meaning of Nazirut, right, yeah. which we don't know if he had that idea that that would be an ideal. But he certainly was psychologically isolated from birth to death, right? So I mean, this is, after, this is after he smote all these people. I mean, that's right. Where he has right. to be far from death, but now right. he's retreated into what is his birthright, you know. It's, right, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was, saw something in the paper today about a saint who came uh, to convert the Native Americans and, and uh, smoked quite a few of them, so I guess... But anyway, this, this is a summary of Shimshon's uh, revenge uh, scenes. Or, or I should say Shimshon's, I don't know, exertion of this power that comes into him now and then from God. So on the way to Timnah to intermarry, a lion comes roaring at him, he rips it apart. I'm getting the colors stronger and stronger because I think the events are stronger and stronger. Then in Timna, his supposed friends uh, solve the riddle by threatening his wife, and he kills 30 in Ashkelon. Now, did he give the riddle thinking they wouldn't get it? Then it wasn't a good pretext because he wouldn't have killed them. And what does it accomplish to kill 30 guys in Ashkelon if your enemy is the Plishti nation, right? Then his father-in-law from Timnah gives the wife away. Now he ties the 30 wolves, burns up the fields. The people who lost their fields are enraged. And so they, uh, they uh, use fire and burn out the wife and her father. And so now he wins in this great battle. And he definitely thinks he's retiring. And the proof is, it says that he was a shofate for 20 years. The way all of our shofate stories have ended is the shofate uh, dies and we see how many years, but Shimshon's alive. 
he thinks he's done. He announced Achar Echdal, but he just knows so little about politics and also so little understanding of the police team. Are the police team going to let the other side say when it's enough revenge? Of course not. And so they come to Yehuda and um, they, um, they camp near Yehuda in a very threatening way. And uh, some representative of the tribe of Yehuda comes out and Pasuk Yud is and, and says, Lama litam aleinu. Why are you, are you coming to fight us? which gives you a feeling that against all Torah principles, there was some sort of peace agreement between the tribes and the police team. In these days, they were not fighting against the enemy. They had, you know, you can say it was detente on the positive side, or you can say it's giving in to the rule of idolatry. And the police team answer in Pasuk Yud, Lesoret Shimshon Alinu, Lao Kasher Asalanu. We came to get, sorry, I left out a space here. We came to get Shimshon and to do to him what he do, did to us, right? He just killed a lot of us. I'm sorry, you must be hearing my thunder and lightning, but I can't mute myself. You can make a bracha. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, they say we just came to take Shimshon because we're going to avenge ourselves. Now, 3,000 men from the tribe of Yehuda, 3,000, go to Seif Etam, Etam and find Shimshon where he's hiding out. And they are furious at Shimshon, right? Just like the Plishtim were mad at their own and burned out the father-in-law and the wife because their own uh, got them into trouble. Now the tribe of Yehuda is angry at their own, not at the Plishtim, but at Shimshon. And they say to Shimshon in the blue in Yod Aleph, Hello, Yadata, Kimoshlim Banu Plishtim. Don't you know that the Plishtim rule over us? Up until now, we haven't heard that one of the enemies is actually the ruler of the land. What have you done to us, right? You've got us in trouble with the rulers. Vayomer Lahem, Ka'ashera Suli, Kenasiti Lahem. I did to them exactly what they did to me. Did you notice that's exactly what the police team said? Right? We came la so low, kasher asalanu. He thinks like a police team. They get him and he gets them. They believe in revenge, but they don't have the Torah and he does. It's very clear in the Torah, loti kom veloti tor. Revenge is not permitted. It doesn't mean that we don't fight wars against enemies, but this is a kind of personal revenge. And um, I told you at the beginning, David Silver has this idea that every show fate in some ways is like the enemy he defeats. And that that may be part of military victory, that you have to identify with the enemy in order to understand what he'll do to beat him. But um, the tribe of Yehuda is not having any of it. Clearly, they do not see them as the, him as their shofet or their leader in any sense, even though we just read he was a shofet for 20 years. And they say to him, uh, Well, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the police team. And he says, and there's something so pitiful, uh, he shavuli pentifga umbi atem. I just want you to swear that you won't lay a hand on me. And it, whether it's that his brother's turning against him is agony, or that he's noticed 
that when he is wronged, Hashem sends this surge of power into him, and he does not want to hurt a fellow Jew. We don't know. But they say, no, 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 we're, we're just going to tie you up and ha hand you over. We won't kill you, as if they could kill him, right? But they're, um, because they are misinterpreting, don't lay a hand on me, as he's afraid. So most of the fortune say it's more like he's afraid of what he'll do. And, and they tie him up for good, seriously. They don't tie him up in a way to help him escape. Right? They double thick new ropes, two thick new ropes, and they tie him up and they bring him to the meeting place. And in that place, I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, the police team are ready. They hand him down over and the police team are just about to snatch him. Of course, Shimshon like he breaks the ropes, grabs a jawbone of a donkey, and it must be from a carcass. Our second animal carcass and our third animal, right? There is an animal element in all this. And he grabs it and that's his weapon, this bone, and he smashes them and he wins and he speaks exactly like a child who just won a relay race. And he says, Hamor, Hamor Otayim, he has a little poem about, oh, wow, wow, just only a donkey bone, I won, won, won. And then again, like a child, he says, oh, I'm so thirsty. But he, he davens to Hashem and says, I'm so thirsty that I'm going to collapse or die, and then I'll be taken by the police chief. He seems to be telling God, you'll have wasted giving me the power if you don't give me a drink. But it's such a bizarre tefillah, so lacking in dignity or religious sensibility. But Hashem sends water gushing out of the bone, and he drinks. And no particular thank you. The end of that episode. Our next episode is... Uh, debauchery and performance are combined. Uh, he goes to the city of Aza, a plishti city, right? The Gaza Strip. And if the most famous picture of Shimshon that we've seen reproduced so many times is the long hair and tearing the lion, the second most is what he did in Aza. He's gone in to Aza to spend the night with a prostitute. The word has gone out that Shimshon's here, right? Shimshon's incapable of going any place incognito with that hair. And um, the town plans an ambush because the gates of the city are open in the day and locked at night. So if he came in and the gates are locked, he's locked in. So they say, well, he can't get out till dawn when the gates will open and we'll be waiting for him. Of course, Shim, I don't know, if, of course, but Shimshon, something tells him that they're preparing the ambush. And so he wakes up at midnight and he doesn't just smash the gate and go out. So this story is what makes people say, although the Sefer doesn't say it, that he was as big as a giant because he reaches his arm to the two posts, the two edges of the gate of a great city, which must be pretty wide, and he just heaves it on his back. I mean, it's, and he walks with it for miles and miles and miles to Hebron, and he stands with no words, with the gates of a great plishti city on him like a backpack. It's an, I mean, it's just such a dramatic scene. And it, it um, and it's the tr transition to his next to the last act, which is uh, Delila, Delilah. That he, when he went to the Zona, no love was mentioned. When he married the young woman in Timna, 
no love was mentioned. But Delila, who lived in Nachal Sorek, a plishti place, was a woman with whom he fell in love. And of course, the Plishtim knew about it. Now, so far, all the enemies have had kings, but the uh, Plishtim are not ruled by a king. They're ruled by Sarnay Plishtim, like they have five chieftains or something like that. The chieftains come to Delila and offer to pay her if she can find out the secret to, in a sense, disarming Shimshon. How can he be bound in a way that we can capture him? Because he keeps bursting out of any, uh, right? He bursts the bounds in Ramat Lehi battle. He burst the bounds of the city when he ripped off the gates. So he said, you've got to find out a way that we can hold him and torture him. And, and she's up for it, and, because that's the kind of woman he always seems to be attracted to. Um, but that it says he loves her, it tells you this is going to be a very painful story. And now I'm going to uh, share with you the psukim of the story. Um, here we go. So we're now in Pasuk Ted Zion, a few psukim in. Vahi acharechen vayehavi sha benachal sorek ushma delila. Vayalu eleha sarnei plishtim vayomru la pati oto. Kajol him. That's what the sarnei plishtim, these generals or chieftains say to her. Well, those worlds are familiar because when the men of Timnah wanted the answer to the riddle, they told his new bride, Pati eti sheikh, cajole your husband, or maybe like seduce him into answering. Vayaged lano et and get him to tell us the answer to the Pen misrofo tach vet beit avich ve'esh. Notice the instruction, cajole, what they want, the chida, and the threat. Now, they do not threaten Delila. In, with Delila, they say, patioto, conjole him, urei bame kochol hagadol, find the source of his great strength, ubame nuchalo, and how can we defeat him and, uh, and uh, tie him up and torture him, and then, Step three is Vanachno Niteng Lach Ish Elaf Mea Kesa. Every one of the five of you of us will give you eleven hundred shekel. And do you remember how much Yosef was sold for? Twenty shekel. So fifty five hundred, five thousand five hundred next to twenty. This is a fantastic price, right? They, and she wants the money. Some have said she had some feeling for him. To me, it's hard to see it, but maybe. Uh, it doesn't say. So her voice is this um, pink and his is the blue. So Delila says to him, Hagida Nali, Bame Kokacha Gado? I think it's a sego. Yeah. Tell me, where does your strength come from? And how could you be tied up so you could be tortured? <laughs> what kind of a question is that, right? She's certainly not hiding her intention. And, uh, and he says in the blue, well, you know, if you've got uh, seven wet ropes that haven't been uh, used for any sort of work and you know you wet them and then they're gonna shrink as they dry or hold me real tight and the result will be the underlined blue Khaliti vahaiti kachad hadam I will become sick 
and I will be like a regular man. I find that v'chaliti interesting. If he said you have to tie me up with those certain ropes, and then my strength will be like a regular man, I wouldn't be surprised. But he seems to think that for him, being like others would be sick. But does that mean he is well? Is that why he doesn't try to escape his mizirut or his mission as he understands it? Because somehow he almost thinks he'll die if he isn't this strange way that he is. There were no, there were no, uh, no hints when the Malach said he should be Nazir min habatan, a Nazir from the womb. That if he did the, if he broke the rules or if he did anything wrong, he'd die or be sick. Um, it, it, in fact, it, it, he seems to have the idea it might be connected to his strength. So he's giving a false answer. Of course, he doesn't mention the hair. So tie me up. And so I bolded in, hey, the Sarnay police steam come. They bring her the special ropes and noticed in Pasuk tent an no rave. But a no rave, an ambush, already failed in the city of Aza. So you can expect the orave won't work. They're ready to ambush him. She knows. They're right there in the room. All the paintings show them hiding behind the curtains. And, um, and when he's all tied up, so you get the feeling like she lets him sleep. Maybe they have a sexual encounter and he falls asleep. And then she ties him up and she screams, Plishtim alecha shimshon. So why does she have to say that? So you might say because she wants it to seem that they snuck in and tied him up, has nothing to do with her, and she's warning him. Anyway, as soon as he says, she says, Plishtim alecha shimshon, he just snaps them like they're nothing. And then we go through it again. She's, uh, uh, she says, oh, yeah, you've been telling me lies. Come on, Shimshon, tell me, how can you be tied up? And in Yud Aleph, he says, OK, I need um, new robes that haven't done any work, it's sort of similar to what he told Yehuda, the Khaliti, and I'll become ill, Vaiti Kachada Dam, I'll become a regular man. And the Oreb is in the room. You see it box. She does it again. She ties him up. The Oreb is the ambush. And she screams, Plishtim Alech Hashim Shon. And the result is he snaps that it's nothing again. Now the Plishtim have lost confidence in Delila. She's not giving up, though. Vatomer Delila Al Shim Shon. Ad, hey, na, hey, Talta. You've been, um, uh, drang around with me, uh, and you keep lying to me, come on, come on, how can we tie you up uh, and imprison you and capture you? And he says, well, if you take uh, seven sticks from the loom, I think you call them a shuttle or something, and you were to bind the uh, seven braids of my head. We think that's what machlafot are. So it gives you a feeling he must have looked like a Rastafarian. His huge mop of head, hair, either all of it or part of it was put in some sort of braids. And, um, and so she uh, takes whatever that stick is. She uh, uh, sort of knits his hair somehow. And um, She's, now we see that it seems each time he was sleeping, because this time when she says, Plishtim Alech Hashim Shon, it says, Vayikatz Mishnato, he woke from his sleep, and then he just pulled the whole contraption out of his hair. It didn't bother him in the least. You notice the Plishtim didn't even come that time. Not a, there was no ambush, there was nothing. But Dalila is one tough cookie. What she hasn't yet done is played the love card. So th this is her last weapon. In Tetvav, 
I'm just going to put it so you can see it all. Vatomer elav, ech tomar ahavti. How can you say you love me? Velibcha ein iti. Your heart isn't with me. Ze shalosh pamim hetaltavi. You've deceived me now three times. Velo higadetali ba me kochacha gadol. Uh, you haven't told me the source of your great strength. Well, she, he knows the three times she got him tied up and three times he had to break three, free. How can he fall for it? And yet he does, right? And it tells us in Ted Zion, she was nudging him all the t- nudging him all the time with her words, and it started to wear him down. And his uh, and you could say he was like frustrated to death, or you could say he gave in, knowing it would lead to death. So. Um, uh, I just want to show you how this parallels other stories. So I hope I won't make you dizzy, but I'm going to go off a little bit over here. Uh, one second. I'm sorry, I, I hate saying, uh, no, maybe I don't have it here. So when she sa- when uh, the police team said to her, Pati et uh, he, those were the exact words that, Timna used with the uh, wife. So here again we have a parallel with his wife who needed the answer to the riddle, right? Uh, Shimshon's wife cried and said, Rex, snake tani, beloved tani, you hate me, you don't love me. I'm skipping, but she, she cried for seven days. Vayagedla ki itzi. I can't see the nikud here, but hatsika too. Can you read it, Nomi? Can you un? Are you able to see it? Well, whatever it is, she uh, because it was wearing him down. So you see the same word, that same kind of. Uh, you know, it's like a student who can't tolerate much frustration for those of you who are teachers. He's had it. Even though he knows against his own self-interest. And what's interesting is that phrase is also used to describe Hashem himself. In the generation of Yiftach, right? The, first he said, I... I, I you know, I've had it with you. I've helped you with too many enemies. I'm not helping this time. And they try, they put away their idols, they cry. They, and then it says, Vatitzar nafsho ba'amal Yisrael. It really means Hashem gave in because even though, due to Yisrael's efforts, even though he knew they'd regress. <coughs> so here we have with Shimshon, he just gives in. It's as if the standard has been lowered. Hashem gave in when really the people hadn't reached the level he wanted from them. And Shimshon gives in to risk being captured, it seems. And he tells her, call Libo his whole heart, right? Now, th- this is the phrase that um, keeps coming up, right? She says, ain't right? You're not sharing with me. Or you'd say nowadays, you're afraid of intimacy. So, she, he tells her everything that is in his heart. And look at what's in his heart. Vayomerla mora lo yalel roshi. A blade cannot touch my head. Ki nazir elokim anini bet anini. I am a nazir from 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 my mother's womb. Im gulachti 
And if I were to have my hair cut, v'sar mimeni kochi, my strength would leave me, v'chaliti, same phrase again, I become sick, v'ayiti kechol hadam, and I just become an ordinary man. Did anyone tell him that his strength is time? He is required not to cut his hair, but he apparently has linked it to Hashem making him Superman, giving him all this strength. It's a very mysterious thing. What if he had answered differently? What if he had answered, my strength is from Hashem? that she had tried cutting his hair and said, my strength is from Hashem. Would Hashem have let his strength go away, right? Why did Hashem, in a sense, play ball with the Delilah's game? Is it because Shimshon, after all these years, doesn't understand Hashem's part in it, has misunderstood what his Nizirut is all about? And why has it been a secret? No, no one, no one said to the mother, don't tell. Did she add that and say, don't tell anyone about this? It's really a mystery, but he pours out his heart. He, my personal belief is he again thought he was giving the wrong answer, but he was sharing more. To me, it's like when he told the riddle of the lion. He's tempted to reveal himself, but he holds back. He wanted to tell someone about his first amazing power, feat of strength when he tore the lion. So that's why he made it into a riddle, but he didn't want anyone to answer it. He wanted to sort of flirt with giving away his secret. And I think here, he is telling her the truth about the hair, that he can't cut it, but he might not believe that this will really harm him. Of course, many Meforshim and the song I'm going to play you from Leah Goldberg disagree. They say he knew he would be defeated, but because he loved her and because it's a burden not to open your heart, he didn't knowingly. Um, and so, this Delila knows right away, this is different. He really, he told me his secret. I'm sorry, the colors are wrong here. Um, and she said, she gets them and she tells the uh, Sarnay Plish team, Alu Hapam, come just one more time. Because this time you can see she says twice. He told me, call Levo. His whole heart, this time I've got the truth. And show up with the money, she must have said, because they do show up with the money. And it's, it's interesting, she doesn't cut his hair herself. Again, he seems to be asleep. Again, it seems like it's after a sexual encounter. She, his head seems to be in her lap, but she, uh, she calls a man who cuts off those seven braids. And, um, and, uh, and his strength leaves him. And she cries out as before, Plishtim alecha shumshon. Vayikatz mishnato, as before, he wakes from his sleep. Vayomer eitzei kapam bapam vayina er. He says, hey, I'm going to snap out. I'm going to free myself, just like before. Vehu lo yada ki Hashem. And he didn't know that Hashem had left him. And for Shimshon, knowing is a huge problem. He doesn't seem to have any insight to his relationship to Hashem, to his own self, and I think maybe not even to his own body and his own strength. I, I always wonder if he had answered differently if he would have kept his strength. But anyway, the way the story went, that's what he said. And he did not, he didn't feel different to himself. 
he didn't know he didn't have his strength. But of course, in Kafala, right, the Pelishtim grabbed him, and they put out his eyes and they imprison him and take him to Aza. Um, we're going to stop in a few minutes. So we haven't finished the Shimshon story, as you all know. We are going to finish it next time. But I want to pause on these gray words, and bring you two artistic presentations of what happened. One is the Leah Goldberg song, where Leah Goldberg uh, tells the story. She entitles it Delila. So you, and it's, that's who she's fascinated with. And she, um, she believes that Shimshon is in some way fatalistic. Um, and, um, and it's sung by Chava Halberstam. It's quite beautiful. I hope I'm going to pull it off technologically and share it with you. And then um, Milton, uh, from his Samson Agonistes, a little bit on what it meant for him to be blind. I think that this is such an intense story that we have to, uh, like, see it a little through the arts. So just for the Delila uh, poem by Leah Goldberg, I won't impose on you and read it all, but um, I know some of you will understand all the words. They're very clearly articulated, but, I, but I'm still going to just tell you a few key phrases. So the refrain is, Hen yadoa yada shebagda. He definitely knew that she would betray him. But he yielded to her clever tongue. You hear the word yada, the sound of yada in all sorts of words. That, and he knew that he die, he die at her hand. And then from the very last verse, right, the, and you can see that these are the words that are most important to Leah Goldberg. He opened his eyes and he saw, right? He had a moment of clarity. After all, she's been saying, how can we tie you up and all that? How can we trap you? And so he opens his eyes and he sees Vereeha. And there are her friends, right? In the beginning, when he got married, there was a bunch of guys who were supposed to be his friends. They were plishting, right? And one of them took his wife later. So these supposed friends, Nikruetenav, Delila, and they put out his eyes. And he says to himself, Delila, like Delila is one of them, another betraying friend. I've been betrayed again and again. I, I seek love and closeness, but there's no one who cares. He has this moment of insight. So now let's see if I pull off the song. I hope I can do it. Okay. And your I'm trying to make a visual. 
אשתי מעלמל בשמשון, כי כבר שם יחומש אלוהיתו, ובכל לילה לא לילה לשמור, ויזר חלדות ומבוא. אשתי מעלמל בשמשון, רק בבוא העדה הפרועה, את נפחה אהבה על פניו, ופקח את עיניו ורעה. So that, you heard it, right? Yes, it was great. I wasn't listening by myself. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I yeah, never yeah. know with technology. Beautiful. I oh, like no, the it's still going. Wait a second. It's going to the next song. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Now let's... All right. Okay. See what a techie I am? Two tries and I get it. You did a good job. <laughs> so... Um, so, um, Milton's approach is a lot less Middle Eastern than that. Um, I, I said earlier, he strongly identifies with old, blind, weak Shimshon. Milton was an extremely powerful, respected, important man, more than a minister, more than a an author, he was really a political leader. But at the end of his life, he was struck by two things. His group was out of favor, he had been a Republican, and he, was, he became blind. And it, it, the very interesting thing is his greatest writing, Paradise Lost and Paradise Found, were written in those last blind years. Because before he was spending a lot of time debating politics, writing important, uh, monographs on his position and all that. And, um, and in this time when he was very depressed, both about being blind and he felt, uh, I think, is that me that has the background noise? Somebody's got a radio or something on. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, maybe Rafi can mute himself. Uh, do you know who that is? Oh, great. Thank yeah. you very yeah, much. Yeah, that was Rafi or Jessica. Okay, thanks. Uh, so um, Milton uh, felt his powers diminished in every way. He was less wealthy, though not poor. He was not important, and he was blind. And he was also one of the greatest poets that ever lived, and someone who knew the Tanakh inside out, forwards and backwards um, in Hebrew. And so he, his beautiful Samson Agonistes begins from the end of Shimshon's life, when Shimshon is old and blind. And in, in his uh, poem play, there's a chorus which are Shimshon's supporters to whom Shimshon is going to say the words I'm about to read. Of course, that's Milton's innovation because he was a person who had followers. Shimshon never had a single follower or supporter, right? But these words, I think, are beautiful. I hope you have the patience for two minutes of it. God, when he gave me strength to show with all how slight the gift was, hung it in my hair, but peace, I must not quarrel with the will of highest dispensation, which herein happily had, a, had ends above my reach to know. 
suffices that to me, strength is my bane and proves the source of all my miseries. So many and so huge that each apart would ask a life to wail. But chief of all, O oh loss of sight, of thee I must complain. Blind among enemies, O oh worse than chains, dungeon, or beggary, or decrepit age. Light, the prime work of God, to me is extinct. And all her various objects of delight, annulled, which might in part my grief have eased. Inferior to the vilest now become of man or worm. The vilest here excel me. They creep yet see. I, dark and light, exposed to daily fraud, contempt, abuse, and wrong, with indoors or without, still as a fool in power of others, never in my own. Scarce half I seem to live, dead more than half. Oh, dark, 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 amid the blaze of noon, irrecoverably dark, total eclipse without all hope of day. Oh, first created beam, and thou great word, let there be light, and light was over all. Why am I thus bereaved thy prime decree? Milton was something, right? <laughs> I, I love those words. Good and, reading. Uh, and, uh, and that's where we'll la leave Shimsham after a moment of seeing clearly in the dark. And uh, in we'll continue next week. Thank you for coming. Enjoy Thank the you, convention, Mary. if that's where you're going next. Yeah, <laughs> heading over to Milwaukee. <laughs> Bye. Right. Thank, Bye. You, Thank, Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.
Thank you. 